Hello and welcome to the Discover History YouTube channel and today I'm going to take a look at one of the oldest uh, weapons that we own that's technically classified as a firearm as such really. So already you've seen uh, an SMLE, the Smelly, the 303 Lee Enfield. Uh, Ian also took a look at the Brown Bess. We obviously have uh, a vast array basically but this is actually the oldest one that I have. And this is what we would classify as a medieval hand gun. And if you do look that up on, for example, Google or in any books, you will notice the word is not spelt how you would uh, think it really. So uh, instead of spelling it as gun, G-U-N, it's often spelt as G-O-O-N-E, hand goon or goon. Uh, and that's really down to the fact that there was no dictionary in the medieval period, so you have a vast amount of different spellings. You also see these weapons often referred to as ordnance, and they're usually grouped together with cannons. So the weapon that I've got is here, and it's a very basic form of firearm. And as you can see, it consists of a wooden beam or tiller, as it's often referred sometimes, purely because it looks like a tiller on a ship uh, that, that, that controls the rudder. And then on the top, you can just about see it there because it's quite rusty, which is the norm really, is a barrel of some sort, which is nothing more than a tube on a bit of wood. Now, we're going to come back to that in a moment. Now, to explain the purpose of a handgun, uh, you have to look at the period that we're talking about. So if you go back to the Middle Ages, um, there was an horrific time, as there was later in history, to be fair, uh, known as siege warfare. And this usually consisted of uh, one nobleman or maybe a different country surrounding a town, a city, or even surrounding a castle. And we all know what happens in sieges. So here we have a fantastic picture from an Osprey book, hopefully you can see that there, and it shows a standard siege. Now, sieges are often drawn out for a long period of time, and the main reason for that is the fact that castles are very, very difficult to, atta to attack. That's mainly down to the fact that you have great towers, as you can see in the drawing here. You've also got very high walls and the thing that you can't see there is the walls are extremely thick and you often have face stone, face stone and a rubble and lime mortar core and these make castles unbelievably strong. And then you have to imagine we've also got here a solid wooden gate, you'd have a portcullis behind that, maybe even a drawbridge, moat and then on top of all that you've got extra fighting platforms and within those fighting platforms you would have soldiers uh, often wearing quite a bit of armour and by the 13th and 14th century there were new ways to attack castles, there was new ways adopted for siege warfare and slowly they were realising that as well as attacking great castles we also have to look at better ways to attack, for example, the knights who were wearing, uh, as time went by, better in better armour. So you do get the creation of ordnance, as it was often referred. And this picture shows what is often referred to as ordnance, or sometimes referred to as a bombard, sometimes referred to as artillery, or as we would call it, cannon, basically. And these were very useful because they would roar, they will make a huge explosion and they will throw a stone ball at a wall much more powerful than the earlier weapons because prior to that we have things like that, trebuchets, catapults and so on. So in a way we have throwing weapons, missile weapons, or catapults and so on but they can only do a certain amount of damage against castles and armoured knights. And like I said, we then get the adoption of the bombard, ordnance, artillery, cannons. And the idea of these is to throw things at the walls still, but with greater power. And this will damage walls and also damage and destroy the better armour that was being worn by knights. So... As time went on, someone came up with this great idea 
that if we put gunpowder in a confined space and reduce the size of a cannon to something that was handheld, you can actually create something called a handgun. Now we often think of a handgun as something that you would hold in the hand, a pistol for example, a revolver. However, in medieval terms, a handgun basically meant a cannon, a bombard, uh, a, a, a piece of ordnance that you can hold in the hand. It's a handgun, a gun that's held in the hand. It was a great step, basically. And what I've got here, as I showed you at the very start, is a very, very basic handgun. Now, it looks rather long, but what you have to remember is the barrel on it is actually very small. It only runs from where my right hand is here to my left hand here. So it's relatively a small weapon. Now, the body of it is made of wood, a very strong wood, things like oak or ash. And that was literally to help you hold the thing, steady the thing, point it in the right direction and guarantee that you're not going to burn your hands on the metalwork. And then on the top here, we have a barrel. Now, there were several ways of making barrels. Some were actually uh, cast, but we know a lot of them were actually made out of iron staves in the same way as making a wooden barrel. Very much like a cooper would take wooden staves and stick them together. Some barrels were actually made out of iron, iron strips all held together. And that's in the way why we get the word barrel. This is called a barrel because the early guns had barrels made like a stave, the staves uh, of, of, of a wooden barrel, for example, that you keep um, fish or keep beer in. So we've got the wooden tiller, the main body of it. And then we've got obviously the short barrel on the top there. And this is a weapon, a firearm that can be fired but it has to be loaded from the muzzle end. And as Ian said with the brown vest, all early firearms could only really be fired from or loaded from the muzzle end. So it has to go down the muzzle, the opening of the barrel. So we've got the tiller, the handle, we've got the barrel on top. There's things like ropes, sometimes pins, and obviously this end of the barrel is actually seated into the woodwork. That holds it all together. And then on the top of the barrel, hopefully you can see it there, there is in fact a touch hole. And the touch hole is quite important because that enables the powder that you've put in the barrel to be exposed on the outside of the firearm to allow you to light it, to allow you to fire it. Now, some of these were as simple as this one. Other ones were starting to become quite complicated. And some of these early firearms, these handguns, were sometimes referred to as hackbutts. And the reason why they were sometimes called hackbutts is because, as you can see from this one here, and hopefully you can see it on the video there, um, it's uh, hacked over the castle wall. And the idea is, when you fire any form of handgun, you get the explosion and the projectile basically traveling out the easiest end which is obviously the open end but you do get to a certain degree what we call recoil so you will get the thing kicked back and the idea of the early guns some of these the hack butts is there's a hook on here and that's why we get the word hack butt it comes from hook butt uh, because you put it on the castle wall and the castle wall takes a recoil, so it's not going to hurt you in any way, shape or form. It sort of steadies the weapon, really. Mine hasn't got that. But as you start with the 14th century and then you travel through, guns were changing. Just like the bombards were taking over from uh, trebuchets, for example, and armour was improving, uh, castles were changing. The guns also change, these handguns also change. But the thing is, as well as carrying the firearm, you did have to carry a number of things to be able to use it. So, as we're using gunpowder, which is actually something that came from China many, many years ago, um, the Chinese have created this uh, explosive item which was made out of three ingredients. Now, I'm not breaking any laws explaining what the ingredients are because they you, you can find these all over the internet, but you do have to mix it in a very careful way, which is why we can tell you what it's made from, but I'm not gonna explain in great detail how it's made specifically. So the Chinese were mixing three ingredients together. First one is potassium nitrate, which we often call saltpeter. 
that's usually collected from inside stables, inside rock surfaces, and we see it all the time. If you ever walk around uh, any town or city, sometimes you will see a brick wall with white crystals on. Well, that's saltpeter. That's basically leaching out of the stonework, and those crystals would have been collected up. The main area for collecting them was places like Castle Stable. So you would collect the saltpeter, the potassium nitrate. That would also be mixed with something known as sulfur, which is a volcanic rock, uh, which is which is quite pungent in smell. It gives gunpowder this um, uh, sort of rotten egg smell to it, really. Um, and then to add to that, you also use charcoal. Those three ingredients make the explosive black powder or gunpowder and those three things uh, all have different properties so you've got the uh, the, uh, the the shock effect the, the 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 volatile bit of the sulfur the saltpeter is often referred to as a fertilizer and the charcoal is something that keeps it burning for a longer period of time than just a quick flash and disappearance now gunpowder black powder was often carried in something like a horn. Now they're not always carried in horns because we know they could have also been carried in leather pouches uh, with a nozzle at the end, a bit like the, uh, the, the costrels, which are leather water bottles or beer bottles. But interestingly, uh, people realize that cow's horn is nature's plastic. It does actually keep things waterproof. So inside this cow's horn, we have got some gunpowder, black powder, but that's the bit that uh, throws the projectile. But as well as that, you need shot. And shot was usually gathered in nothing more than a leather bag that could be tied to a belt. Now, the shot can be one of two things. Sometimes they used things like this. And that is actually a very carefully chosen pebble that comes from a river or even off the beach. So it's a pretty much uh, circular uh, pebble. Not brilliant, and there are many flaws in it, but that's a pebble. Or the alternative could be a piece of lead shot. So what they've done is created a mould, often made out of stone, and poured molten lead into it, and out comes these lead balls. So that's another form of shot, basically. And then, as well as carrying powder in shot, there needs to be something that ignites the whole lot. Now, there was two methods in the uh, 14th century. The first one was uh, an, uh, an iron wire. Now, that would be a small piece of iron. And the problem with that is if you had a handgun on a castle wall, they would have to keep that iron in a fire. And that iron would be glowing hot. And when it came to firing it, they would take the hot iron, obviously wrapped up in cloth, and the hot iron would be used to touch the gunpowder. And that is enough to actually set it off. However, the more common method was actually some cord. And this is nothing more than rope that was often used on beds, for example. Uh, beds often had, um, not springs as we have today, but rope. Uh, and uh, it's it's even the sort of rope that you would use for tying animals uh, up with and that sort of thing. It, it was general cord. And that cordage um, would have been soaked in usually potassium nitrate, so saltpeter again. And that creates something that glows. Don't get a flame on it, but it glows and it burns down very, very slowly. So that is often referred to as match cord. So you would have to carry all those things to be able to do your job as a hand gunner. Now, you're probably thinking, how do you actually load this thing? Well, I'll explain it as we go. Now, the first thing you would do is you would take your handgun, your early firearm, and remember this is an early one. They do change, obviously, as we go through the Middle Ages. And the first thing is to load it with powder. So you would take your powder horn, you would remove the stopper, and you would have to guesstimate 
you'd have to guess literally how much powder that you're putting in. And this refers or, or relies on the person using it to have that knowledge. He would be used to it. He would have been doing it over a certain period of time. So he would know exactly how much to put in. So you guess how much powder that you've put in. You then take your bag with shot in it and you drop on top of that the pebble or maybe if you're lucky you've got something almost perfect which is lead shot it's a round ball and you're not really going to have many accidents with that you drop that into the end now some people especially if you're up on a castle wall which is remember the main reason for these guns um you would often put something in the end to prevent the ball from from rolling out because obviously if you're up high and you're pointing down whatever you've put in is literally going to roll out so you could put in some cloth uh, if there's straw nearby you could poke that into the end and then you would have to take a stick and that's the stick just of here and that stick would be used literally to bash everything down inside so inside there now you've got gunpowder some shot and some leaves or bits of cloth on top that's pretty much ready to go the last thing uh, a soldier would then need to do is pour a small amount of powder into the little hole at the top there the touch hole and he would then have to make sure his burning match cord is glowing red hot and that would be ready to go he would have to keep blowing on it making sure it's staying on uh, not gone out and making sure it's a really really pointed glowing ember he would then either hook it under his arm which is very very common using his arm the upper arm to actually hold the thing in place or as you often see in some pictures it would be held on the shoulder and the weight of this hand would be forced down to try and hold it to steady the thing if we had a hack butt it would often have this hook so you could hook it over the defenses which would also take the recoil on it i'm going to use the under the arm um, uh, method and obviously this is one which you often use your uh, or lose your eyebrows your eyelashes and the bit of hair that you've got at the front and then using your hand holding it as far away from the point as you can uh, you then move this into the touch hole where you have some exposed powder and this is where like you can see uh, it's going to go off in your face and they literally did so you then touch the powder that's exposed this flashes off and it actually follows that vent that touch hole into where the main charge is the main charge will then go bang and obviously you will get some recoil but because this is an open end most of the explosion most of the gunpowder most of the grass or leaves that you've put in there but more importantly the shot will then travel out of the end and towards your enemy the problem with these they do take a long time to load you are often exposed when you're shooting it especially if you're shooting over a castle wall and the problem with these is they're not that devastating but you must remember in the middle ages you would not have heard a noise louder than thunder now that's hard to imagine because obviously today we have vehicles we have cars we have aircraft in the sky in just the uh, the, the loud uh, buzz of a modern city you just don't get it so thunder was very very loud and these things made a louder bang than that the other shocking thing is if you were close enough to hit a person a lump of lead hitting them or a very solid pebble will create some horrific injuries probably not kill a man but create horrific injuries and the sad thing about that is that would have terrified the people near that injured person so in a way i always say these early guns are more psychological they're loud they make a mess of a person if they get hit um, than actually effective as a killing machine and you have to remember it's not until later in history with the brown bears things like the lee enfield that they become this devastating weapon of war now just to end this video i'd just like to say these were predominantly being used in siege warfare but there was a lot of commanders, a lot of these medieval people like the Dukes of uh, Burgundy and people like that, 
that are suddenly they have cogs ticking in their heads saying how can we use these weapons on the battlefield not sieges how can we use them on the battlefield and we know by the end of the 14th century more and more of them are starting to appear and strangely they're being used in a skirmishing role very much like crossbowmen so whilst the armies are lining up you could send forward your handguns along with your crossbowmen to harry the enemy whilst you're still maneuvering to get into position but it's quite interesting so obviously today's video is being about the early medieval handgun. If you find weapon development interesting, let us know because what we can do is do some more videos taking you through. But if you miss the ones, for example, on the Brown Bear, so the Lee Enfield, do take a look in the playlist under the title of Military History and you will find them there. This one will go in there as well. And then eventually, um, either by the end of lockdown or by, by, by next year, two years time, you'll be able to follow them and see how weapons have developed from this early form of gun right up to pretty much the modern day. Anyway, on that note, have an enjoyable weekend. Uh, stay safe, stay in, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.